and this time I would like to do the same thing use the same two vectors k of magnitude 5 direction 30 degree and b of magnitude 2 direction 150 degree and this time I would like to add them up but using uh, mathematics so not graphically uh, this is called the component notation. Now, at first sight, you might think, well, all you have to do is, if you want to add them up, is just add up all the magnitudes together and add up all the direction together, and that may work. Let's try it out. If I add 5 and 2, I get 7. So the magnitude of my vector C would be 7, and its direction would be 180. But as we plot this, we realize that A was around here, B was around here. And if we plot this C by just adding the two magnitudes and the two directions together, we end up with 7 at 180 degrees, which obviously is not the vector that we obtained previously. So obviously we can't do that. So there is no way that we can add two vectors when they're given to us that way. The trick and the method is to convert the notation of those two vectors into what we call the component notation. So, uh, let's review our trig. I'm going to decompose my vector A into two vectors. Now, from your reading, you've seen that you can decompose any vector into the sum of any others. So if you have vector A, you can decompose it as a vector A1, A2, A3, A4, A5, A6, A7, doesn't matter. You can add as many as you want. As long as you start at a common place and you end at the end of the original vector, the sum of all those vectors would be the same as the original vector. We don't care about the path, we only care about the starting point and the ending point. And you can use one, I mean, well, not one, two, three, four, hundred, hundred thousand vectors. You can always decompose a vector into the superposition of n other vectors. <clears throat> For this class, what we will do is we will, since we will be working in two dimension, primarily, next semester in C270, you will be dealing with three dimensions. The method would be exactly the same. What we'll do is we'll decompose every of our given vector into two vectors. So we have a vector A, and we'll decompose it into one and two vectors. Now what we'll do is we'll be clever, and we're going to decompose our vector A into two vectors, but we're going to restrict the direction of each of those two vectors. So the first vector, this one, will be chosen to be along the x. And the second one will be chosen to be along the y. Okay? And I'm going to call this one ax, because that's the one along the x. And I'm going to call this one ay, because that's the one along the y. Okay? So I have just decomposed my vector into two vectors. And I have chosen those two vectors to be respectively along the x-axis and the y-axis. That, of course, implies that I have defined my x and my y, which uh, I haven't done. So here we go for y. Okay. Now, why did I do this? Why did I pick uh, this particular so, uh, solution? Is because I want to make a right triangle pop up. Since A X is along X and A Y is along Y, since the axis X is perpendicular to the axis Y because we've chosen an ultra normal current system, then we know right away that A X is perpendicular to A Y. And this allows us to identify a nice little right angle triangle where we know the length of the hypotenuse, which in this case is five. So, if you recall your trig, then you know right away that the magnitude or the distance or the length of the vector AX is nothing else but 5 cosine of the angle, which in our case happens to be 30. 
And similarly, the length of the AY vector is nothing else but phi sine 30. Okay, so that's the reason why we decompose our vectors into two, such as one is along the x, one is along the y, because then in this case, both vector ax and y are perpendicular to each other. We can recognize a nice right angle triangle, and we can use the trig identity. For the length of ax, it will be the hypotenuse times the cosine of the angle, and for the ay, which refers to the opposite side of the right angle triangle, we just take the hypotenuse, which is 5 times the sine of the angle. So it's nice in this case because we know we can always associate cosine with the x and sine with the y. The only thing you have to be careful is you can only do this if and only if your angles are being defined from the positive x going counterclockwise. If you make those choice of angles, you can always associate the cosine with the x and the sine with the y. Okay? However, if you decide to pick an angle which is not defined from the positive x going counterclockwise, you cannot associate the cosine with the x automatically and hope it's always going to be correct. Similarly, you cannot just associate sine with the y and hope it's always going to be correct. Okay? So for this particular example, I will always pick my angle from the positive x going counterclockwise so I can make the analogy. So, let's write that down mathematically. My vector A is the sum of two vectors, Ax and Ay. And now what I'm going to do is I would like to rewrite... Oh, thank you. 3.83 is, uh, I believe, the first one. Thank you. And the second one might be 2.5. Is that correct? Sine of 30 is 1 half? Yeah. Oh, 4.3. Oops. Ah. <laughs> okay, so cosine of 30 is square root of 3 over 2. So we have 5 half times... Okay, so we all agree on which number? 2.5, 4.3, or 4.33? <laughs> uh, okay, hang on. All right, thank you. Uh, let me uh, okay. Four point three three. Okay. So now I would like to remember those are the length of our vector ax, and two point five is the length of my vector ay. And in this notation right here, I'm dealing with the vector AX and the vector AY. So what we can do is we can always write a vector. Let's say a vector X, such that this vector is expressed in terms of its magnitude and in terms of its direction. And to identify any direction, I will use the dummy variable E. Now, you've noticed that I've used several notations. Sometimes I use x, sometimes I use x arrow with two. Looks like the uh, absolute value. It's the same thing. Those two refers to the magnitude. They're just numbers. And they better be positive numbers. There is no such a thing as a negative magnitude. And the e will refer to the, right, to the direction. And e can specify any direction, any angle. Now, since my AX is along and has been chosen to be along the X-axis, I know that its direction is being dictated by my unit vector I, which is the one along the X. So really, AX is the magnitude AX of that vector AX times the unit vector in the I direction. And similarly, AY is the magnitude AY times the unit vector in the Y direction, 
which is J. Okay? So remember, there's nothing uh, obscure about this. What it means is, let's say you pick a vector which is horizontal. This is your unique vector I. And your vector is this length, this long. That's my vector Y, I know, Z. I just need to count how many times I spam the unique vector I. So one, two, three, four. So to represent my vector Z in terms of I, Z is obviously four times I. Four refers to its magnitude, I refers to its direction. If I'm going the other way, then obviously it would be minus four I. If I'm going up, then I will use the J in the vector. Okay? Okay, so now I just need to fill out the value of AX and AY. So my vector A is nothing but four point, I'm just going to use one uh, digit, plus 2.5 J. This is what we call the component notation representation of my vector A. I have decomposed my vector into two vectors, one along the X, which is 4.3 I, and one along the Y, which is 2.5 J. Okay? So, we get the idea of how to decompose vectors and how to write them. The key points are make sure that you don't forget your arrow to represent vectors. Make sure you use the little hat to represent any ve vectors. And make sure that if you have a vector on the left hand side, you better have the sum of vectors on the right hand side. So vector A is not equal to 4.2 plus 2.5. Vector A is equal to 4.2 times unit vector I plus 2.5 times unit vector J. In mathematics, if you've taken calculus 3, you might have seen this notation. 4.3, 2.5. Same thing. So you can use any addition that you want. OK, so now let's uh, switch board and let's express the other vector B. So let's recall A was 4.3i, 2.5j, and b was given to me as magnitude of 2, direction 150, while well, this was, was direct magnitude of 5, 30 degrees. So I'm going to do the same thing. Since I know for sure that the angle given to me was measured from the positive x going counterclockwise, I can just close my eyes and write b is equal to the magnitude of that vector, 2, times cosine of the angle. That's my i component. And then the other one is the sine. So it's nice and easy. That's the advantage of choosing vectors defined from the positive x going counterclockwise. Now you know that this vector b is going up and left. So if we stick with the same current system, which is positive towards the right and positive up, we know that the x component vector b better be negative because you end up going towards the left, and the y component is going up positive. You can check this by plugging the numbers as you realize that cosine 150 is nothing else but minus cosine of 30 degrees. And similarly, sine of 150 is the same as the sine of 30 degrees. And indeed, the first one is negative, the second one is positive. Okay? Now that I've expressed both vectors in component notation, I can just add them up. If I define vector C as the sum of A and B, let's do it slowly and carefully. 4.3i uh, plus 2.5j, that's my A, plus minus 2 cosine 30i plus 2 sine 30j. Now I'm dealing with a bunch of i's and a bunch of j's. So again, you want to make sure that you only group together the terms that are alike. 
we cannot combine the i's and the j's. It's like mixing apples and oranges. We can only stick with all the i's together and all the j's together. That's the reason why it's very important to keep track of who's the i's and who's the j's. So don't forget to write them down. So I'm going to group all the i's together. And I have 4.3. Then I'm going to minus 2 times cosine of 30. Cosine of 30 is square root of 2. I'm going to cancel the 2. And then I'm going to group the j which is 2.5, and I'm going to add sine of 30 times 2, which is 1 half times 2, which is 1. So, roughly, my vector C will be square root of 3 is 1.7, 4.3 minus 1.7 is roughly 2.6. Point five J. Oh, I goofed. Oh, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Mitchell. Yeah, that's correct. PX, PY, minus 1.7. Okay, good. So 4.3 minus 1.7 is roughly 1.2.6. And 1 plus 2.5 is 2.5. Okay, good. So now we did. What we've done is we know that vector C as this refers to a vector cx, and this refers to a vector cy. So now we know that our vector c can be expressed as cx is obviously positive in the i direction. So this is my x, this is my y. cx is, if this is my unit vector i, and j, Cx is 2.6 times i, so 1, 2, roughly, all the way up to here. That's my Cx. Along the x, my C1 is going up because it's j, 3.5, so I'm going to go 1, 2, 3, 3.5. This is my Cy. And therefore, my C starts from the beginning of Cx, joins the end of Cy, and that's my vector C which obviously and hopefully is the same uh, as the first board when we got it graphically. Except now we have the exact values. So from this point, what we can do is re-express this vector express in component addition back into this form. That is, we can extract the magnitude and we can extract the direction uh, from those two components. We can use the Pythagorean theorem backwards. This is easy. If you're looking for the length of the hypotenuse, you just take Cx, you square it. You take Cy, you square it. You add them up, you take the square root, bang, you get the value for C. So the magnitude of C, which is, again, always positive, is going to be the square of the first component, Cx, plus the square of the second component, Cy. You take the square root, bang, that will give you the magnitude of C. For the direction, all you have to do is take the arctangent. Let me go here. The angle of theta will be the arctangent of the y component over the x, 2.5, 2.6. Now, be careful when you take the arctangent of such a beast. Uh, check whether you're in gradient or radian of degree. Okay. Uh, also. In this particular case, the value given to you by your calculator uh, will always be between 0 and 90. In this case, my angle is indeed between 0 and 90. So that's easy. Uh, you might run into a situation where your vector C is in a different quadrant. So let's investigate that little issue. Let's imagine that you have a vector Cx and Cy. And you calculate the angle. You know the value of Cy, you know the value of Cx, so you're going to do arctangent of whatever you obtain for Cy divided by Cx. Now your calculator is going to give you an angle between 0 and 90 all the time. You cannot do anything else. Now, an angle between 0 and 90 is obviously not the angle of vector C. Because obviously vector C is defined 
in the second quadrant. Even worse, you don't know which angle the calculator is giving you. Is it alpha or is it beta? So, there are two rules that you want to remember in order not to trust your calculator and not let the calculator give you the wrong answer. First of all, you should check, check for the signs. If CX and CY are both positive, you know that your angle is in the first quadrant. If CX is negative and CY is positive, like in this particular case, you know that your angle is in the second quadrant, which means you're going to have to add 90 degrees to your answer. If both CX and CY are negative, then you know in the third quadrant. Therefore, you need to add 180 degrees to your final answer, or to the answer that the calculator is going to give you. And finally, if your CX is positive and the CY is negative, you're in the fourth quadrant. Now, we still need to figure out whether it's the alpha one or the beta one. A nice trick to figure it out is to check the magnitude of CX and CY. For instance, if CX is less than CY, then obviously this length is less than this one. If the calculator is giving you an angle which is 50 degrees, it's obviously bigger than the 45 line which separate alpha and beta to be the same value. So if theta gives you an angle of 50, you know right away this 50 refers to the beta because Cx is less than Cy. If your calculator gives you an angle of 35 as the answer of the Cy divided by Cx and taking the inverse tangent, you know right away that 35 must be the alpha angle. Okay, so if this, the solution is 35, then you have to add 90 degrees. But if it's the case where CX is less than CY and the calculator gives you 50, then really you have to take 180 minus 50, and this would be your answer, which of course would be this angle. Okay? So my point is, do not trust the calculator. You need to check two things, the sign of each of the components and the magnitude of both. The sign will tell you which quadrant you're working with, and the magnitude will tell you whether it's the upper angle or the lower angle. Once you know those two pieces of information, then you know whether you have to add 180, add 90, take 180 minus your angle, take 270 plus your angle or minus your angle or whatever. So I would suggest you know, plot it much easier. And you can avoid making mistakes. It takes 10 seconds to plot a vector. A lot of students decide not to plot anything, uh, I would strongly suggest, you know, just do a little graph on the side. Plot your vectors, get a feel of where it's going. It will help uh, avoid mistakes. Okay? Woo -hoo! Thank you. So, 53.4. Oh, 53.3. So, let's go back to the previous screen. In this case, Cx is less than Cy, so if I take plot Cx, Cy, I'm going to make it much bigger. If we're given an angle of 53, you know that 53 is bigger than 45, so you know for sure 53 is this one. If Cx was much bigger and CY, and the calculator was going to give you, going to give you 53, you know it would have been the other one, which is this guy. Okay? And in this case, they're both positive, so you know they're both in the first question. Any questions?